Hello, and welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. Today we'll be looking at how I managed pixel-perfect collision detection in my first published game, Leander, on the Commodore Amiga. Collision detection in games generally used to take a lot of processing power. If you had 20 objects on screen, for instance, you'd have to check each one individually against the main character to see if any of them overlap. And doing this accurately would be very hard, as objects generally aren't just simple shapes like squares. Some games just used what we called box checks. Each object would have an imaginary box around it, and if the boxes overlapped, then the collision was said to have occurred. Programmers liked boxes, as you could generally check if two boxes had overlapped with relatively few lines of code. Of course, the problem with boxes was that they didn't really accurately describe the shape of many of the objects you wanted to collide with. A guard with a pike staff extended, for instance, would need a huge box around it, and then you'd take damage if any part of your character's box overlapped, which wouldn't be very fair. Even so, a lot of games stuck with just box checks, which is why some games are known for having bad collision detection. Another solution was to have more than one box at a time, so one for the guard's body and one for his pike staff, for instance. This, however, made the code more complex, as you then needed to start having animated boxes, and you also needed to check more of them, and it still wasn't a perfect representation of the shape. However, lots of games went this route, and today we still use these kinds of approaches for collision. With Leander, I was obviously looking for the simplest, most accurate, and most efficient solution possible, which led me to look into what the Amiga hardware supported. It had a control register called CLXCon, which allowed a flag to be set if any sprites overlapped any background graphics, even by one pixel. This seemed to be a very useful feature, but it had its drawbacks. If you look at all the sprites used in Leander, you can see that the first problem is that although I use sprites for the main character and his weapons, I also use them for the power bar at the bottom of the screen, the mountains, the scores, lives, and so on. So if any of those sprites made contact with any of the background graphics, the flag was set. Not very useful. The second problem was that the background displayed all the enemies and chests and so on, but also the trees and rocks and buildings. So if you were walking past a tree or a cliffside, then the flag would be set then as well. Luckily, the Amiga had a special mode called Dual Playfield Mode. This allowed you to have two separate overlapping backgrounds, each with different things on them. But instead of being able to use a 32 color palette, in practice, you were limited to just seven colors on each playfield. And it also slowed down the main processor, meaning you'd get less done each frame. However, we had a great graphic artist who still made the backgrounds look fantastic even in seven colors, and dual playfield mode had some amazing advantages. Firstly, it meant that background graphics, like trees and cliffs, could be kept completely separate from all the enemies and collectibles. Normally in a game, you had to use lots of very time-consuming masking techniques to move overlapping objects around using a single playfield. Using dual playfields made this very easy. But the most important advantage was that I keep everything I wanted to collide with on its own playfield, so enemies, chests and collectibles could all have a playfield to themselves. Then, if any sprites overlapped that playfield alone, I knew an important collision had taken place. So that was one problem solved, but how could I stop the score sprite, for instance, triggering the collision flag? Well, I found a solution using my favourite piece of Amiga hardware, the copper chip. The copper, short for coprocessor, was a programmable finite state machine that executed a programmed instruction stream synchronised with the video hardware. In simple terms, it could execute basic instructions as the raster beam on the TV output reached a certain screen position. So I wrote some copper code that waited until the score and so on had been drawn at the top of the screen and then read the collision flag. Luckily, reading the flag also reset it, so I just ignored the value read and then waited until the main character had been drawn and read it again. This time, I knew that if the flag was set, there must have been a collision between the main character and his weapons and the object playfield. Then, and only then, I used a simple box check to find out what object was nearest to me and process the collision. And as I only had to run the box check code if the collision flag was set, the entire collision code took a fraction of the time of any other system, leaving me plenty of spare time to dedicate to making everything else look bigger and better. And as the code was fundamentally based on pixels overlapping in the hardware, the accuracy was perfect. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Coding Secrets, and if you have, please consider leaving a like or subscribing, and I'll see you in the next episode.